taken from the 18th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. And this is part of the scene of Jesus before Pontius Pilate on Good Friday. Well, Pontius Pilate came back to his headquarters and he said to Jesus, So, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, Did you think of that yourself? Or did someone tell you to say that? And he said, Do I look like a Jew? What did you do? The chief priests and your people have handed you over. And Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were of this world, I would have told my followers to fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jews, but I'm not that kind of a king. And Pilate said, so then you are a king? And Jesus said, you have said so. For this reason I was born and for this reason I came into the world, that I might testify to the truth. And everyone who loves the truth recognizes my voice. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Today is Christ the King Sunday. It's the day when we acclaim Jesus as King of King and Lord of Lords. It is the day when we acclaim him as Lord of the nations, Lord of heaven and earth, Lord of the church, Lord of the worlds, Lord of the universe. And that's really good news. But I think it's only really good news if it becomes much more personal. If I'm able to say, not only is Jesus Lord of all these things, but he's also my Lord. That's where Luther began when he wrote his explanation to the second article of the Apostles' Creed. You may recall how that goes. I believe that Jesus Christ true God, begotten of the Father from all eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. My Lord. What does that mean, to confess Jesus as my Lord? What are the implications for our daily lives? What does that look like, to live with Jesus as my Lord? Well, to do that, I want to walk you through this morning uh, one of the biblical stories. It's the story of the rich young ruler. And the story begins with this young man coming to Jesus with a faith question. He came to Jesus and he knelt before Jesus and he said, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus told him to keep the commandments. And he said, I've kept them all ever since I was a boy. So apparently, this young man was a spiritual man, a church-going man. He's a man who probably went to the synagogue every Sabbath to pray. He probably went up to Jerusalem to celebrate the feasts at the temple. He probably honored his parents. He was a guy who tried to do the right thing. But he was missing something. And so we're told that Jesus looked at him and loved him. And he said, you lack one thing. Go. Sell everything you have. Give the money to the poor. And then you will have treasure in heaven. And then come and follow me. Why? Why did Jesus tell this young man to do that? What was behind it? Well, I want to start by telling you what was not behind it. Jesus didn't ask this young man to do that because Jesus needed the money. Jesus does not have a cash flow problem. Jesus has all the resources of the universe at his disposal. I once uh, heard a biblical scholar say he wished that we could amend the first line of the Apostles' Creed so that it would read, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator and owner of heaven and earth. Our Lord is the owner of everything. Everything that I call mine is really his. It came from him, and it will return from him to him. Remember uh, what we hear in 1 Timothy? We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we will take nothing out. 
everything I call mine is really his. And it's just on loan to me for a time. And one day I will need to give it back. And so Jesus doesn't need our donations, our offerings to do his work as the Messiah. He didn't need what this guy had to be able to serve the poor. If we don't give generously, he'll find somebody else who will. If I don't give generously to do his work and his will in my life, he'll find somebody else. And if we as a congregation don't, he'll find another congregation that will. Cash flow is not his problem. And so that's not why he asks us to give generously. No, there was something much different going on with this young man. You see, there was something in his life that he loved more than Jesus. There was something in his life that was really his Lord and God. Something that he placed first in his life, and that was his money. It was his possessions. It was his bank account. That was more important to him than anything else. And Jesus knew that, and so we're told Jesus loved him and asked him to divest himself of all those things so that he could come and follow. Money can do that. Money can get in the way of our following Jesus. Money is a wonderful, wonderful servant, but a terrible master. It's a wonderful servant. I am so delighted by your generosity over these last three years to our capital campaign. Second mile giving above and beyond your regular giving. It's allowed us to pay off our $425,000 mortgage. We saved $100,000 in interest by doing that, by paying it off in three years instead of 13. So we can use that hundred grand for other things besides paying the bank. And we set aside 10% of all we gave for outreach, and so we gave about $7,000 to Nourishing Hope, our food distribution program, so that we could have a re refrigerated truck. We gave $7,000 to our healing and wholeness ministry to get that launched. We've given probably $10,000 now to the school district to help families in need with basic necessities during the pandemic. We just decided to give $10,000 to the Lutheran Church in Nigeria because they're trying to start a Lutheran university there, and you'll hear more about that in these coming weeks. We've been able to do some wonderful things because of our generosity. Money can be a wonderful blessing when it's used for the Lord's loving purposes. But it's, it's a terrible master. And when it becomes the master of our lives, it can lead to tragic and sinful things. That's why, why St. Paul tells us the love of money is the root of all evil. He didn't say money is the root of all evil. That's what a lot of people think, but that's not what it says. It is the love of money that is the root of all evil. And that's what had happened to this young man. He loved his money more than he loved his God. And so that's why Jesus told him to go, to sell, to give, to come, to follow, because he knew it was his money that was getting in the way of his following Jesus. And so this young man had a decision, a decisive moment, maybe the most decisive moment in his life. Who or what was going to be his Lord and Master? Was it going to be his money or was it going to be Jesus. Who would be first in his life? And then we read one of the most tragic, one of the saddest lines in the Bible. We read that when he heard what Jesus said, he went away sorrowful because he had great wealth. He was this close to the kingdom of God. Jesus stood there right in front of him. The incarnation of the kingdom of God, the treasures of heaven 
right in front of him. Jesus had invited him to, into his fellowship. Jesus wanted to give him a life better than anything he could imagine, better than anything his money could buy, give him a life filled with the treasures that come only from above. He was this close to being there. And he turned and walked away because he loved his money more than he loved his God. Jesus always asks me for the one thing I don't want to give to him. Always. I may say, Lord, you can have everything else, but this one thing I'm going to keep for myself. I'm going to manage this. I'm going to control this. I'm going to be in charge of that. And this is always the one thing he asks me to give him. Because if he doesn't have that one thing, he really doesn't have me. He's really not Lord of my life. Something else is. And he doesn't want just some of me, a part of me, most of me. He wants all of me. And if he doesn't have that one thing, then he really doesn't have me at all. Now, that one thing may be my money. That happens a lot here in America in the kind of consumer culture we live in where we're constantly being pressed to accumulate more, to have more, to, to get more. But it can be almost anything. It might be my career. Lord, you can have everything else in my life, but my career, I'm going to manage that. I'm going to decide my way forward. I'm not going to have anybody tell me what to do with my vocation. Or it might be my children or my grandchildren. Lord, you can have everything else, but I'm going to be in charge of them. I'm not going to let you tell them what they should do with their life, how they should lead their life. I have better ideas. Or it might be my time. Lord, you can have everything else, but my free time, <laughs> that's for me. I'm going to use it however I want. Or it could be a relationship. It could be, Lord, you can have everything else, but this one relationship I'm not going to surrender to you because there is no way I'm going to forgive that person after what they've done to me. I am going to get back and I am going to get even. He always asks for the one thing I don't want to give him because he wants me. And he wants to give me that life that's better than anything I can imagine, that life that's full of his riches, that life lived in his company and in the company of his love. He asks for that one thing because he loves us so deeply and dearly. And he wants to be Lord of all of our lives. Today is our Stewardship Sunday. And in a few moments, you're going to be invited to come forward with prayer cards, with uh, commitment cards, if you haven't done that yet. And I do hope you give generously. I can tell you that your generosity determines in large part how much we can be the Lord's living, loving presence in the world. It makes a huge difference. It makes an eternal difference, not just for ourselves, but for many others near and far. But I hope that this morning is more than just making a financial commitment. I hope you take this opportunity today to commit yourself once again fully to the Lord Jesus Christ, to give him everything. Give him all that you are, all that you have, all that you hope to be. Give him your body and your soul. Give him your mind and heart. Give him today and tomorrow and all the days of your life. Give him your hopes and your dreams. Give it all to him. Make him the Lord of your life. Make him the Lord of all of your life. Because there's no better Lord we can have, no better Lord than Jesus, because he is, above all, the Lord of love. Amen.